Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome our associate pastor, Chris Massengill. Sure is quiet in this Pentecostal church. How many know that God loves a joyful giver? <laughs> All right, before we get started here today, because if I don't do it now, I'll forget to do it, and it's got to be done. Sometimes, you know, you just got to do what you got to do, right? Okay, so we, we are going to have a discussion here today because we know that God shows up to a prepared atmosphere, amen? amen? And we have set aside this place and the time for our service for an altar, for altar time and service, correct? So God will show up and entering. That is probably the most important time of this service is altar time because that's when God gets to show himself real to you. We can practice worship and get it great. We can practice a sermon and get it right, great. But when God shows up and touches you and changes your life, he becomes real to you. So this is quite a, a set of time side prepared for him to show up. So in order to do that, we know that chaos brings disorder. Can we agree on that? Yes. Chaos brings disorder. In order to have a move of God, you have to have order. And so we have, you know, through time and, and trial and stuff, we have developed an idea that would, might work, and but God has kind of directed the leadership. And how many know that a fish stinks from the head down? Fish stinks from the head down. Let me say that again. The fish stinks from the head down. Saying that, I have to put it this way, is... We have, God has spoken to us to design a place because we're limited on space right now that we have set it up that this over here is where the altar workers are to minister to you. You know, wherever two or more gathered, God is there in the presence and in God's presence is where the miracles happens, right? So you need a miracle. You might want to step into God's presence where he guarantees we're two or more together. He's there in the midst with you. So how many here want to meet with God today? So we have set that time, so there's always two over here at least, and there's always two over here at least, and this is a place to go when you come and you need prayer, and you need someone to lay hands on you. The Bible is very, talks very much about the power of laying hands on people. So we have that opportunity set here. We have designed, there is a space right here, right, that is for you to come when you don't want to be touched. You just need to spend some intimate time with him at his feet and you come here and you spend time here at his feet so what that means is leaders leaders do not touch it's prepared for those who want to meet with god the moment you step from there to there you put yourself in his shoes and that is a mighty load to carry what an intimate place it is to be in a place where you are having conversation with God yourself to have some layman come over and interrupt because they have the Holy Spirit saying, I need to speak to you now. The Holy Spirit doesn't work like that. That's chaos. So the head stinks from the fish stinks from the head down. So let's go there first, okay? Secondly, because of chaos and people who feel like the unctioning of the Holy Ghost has come upon them, that they need to come and help the altar workers by playing hands-on, we've had to put people at post right here. So their job is not to intimidate you or to scare you. Their job is to try to keep order in this atmosphere because it's quite small. So they have to, if you're going to come and be here, they look at you and go, I just want to be there. They direct you over here. Not over here because somebody's liable to fall on you. Am I being correct? This is a Pentecostal church, right? And so their job is to direct you over here. Not that they're jerks. They're just trying to keep order from going into chaos. Ooh, I made a sermon about that, huh? <laughs> and if you're here to have someone intervene with you and lay hands upon you, they will direct you over here. And there are times it takes a little longer here than, than usual because some operate quicker than others, okay? We're not McDonald's. We're not on a time clock. God is in charge of everything that happens here. This is his atmosphere. This is his time. 
So as long as we all agree to be in order, God will move and manifest himself and speak to each and every one of us. So the guys standing here aren't being rude. They're just doing what God's called them to do, and that's to bring order where there could be chaos. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Now that we know how that all works. Good morning, church. How many of you came expecting today? I love that. Ooh, that's just like the Corinthian church. They come with a, a word. They come with a song. But can I share some truth with you today? So I'm going to speak on a subject that most preachers won't even touch. How many of you like me for that? All right, five of you. I'm safe. Now, it's been a long time since I preached on this subject. This used to be my go-to thing because I believe what I preach, and if I don't believe it, I won't preach it. But so it's been a long time since I preached on this subject. And so today, I'm going to talk about the grace of giving. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Where's, where's my title? Oh, he changed it. This guy. I didn't give... I didn't give uh, Patrick a title. So he created one himself until he asked me, and I liked his title better than I liked mine. Because he didn't hear the sermon. He only went off his notes. Got to put it up there, Patrick. You're killing me, buddy. Just let me remind you, church, that when the Holy Ghost speaks to you and you do something, don't change your mind. That's the devil. Okay? That's the devil. He comes to steal the word out of your heart. It was so, I was like, that's perfect, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. What was it, Patrick? Glory upon. Now, now when we preach this message, you'll understand where he got that. And you got to remember, he doesn't have, the, he's only got scriptures to go by. So the Lord gave that to him. And I was like, ooh, I like that. Anything has to do with glory in it. It's, it's, okay, so it's been a long time since I preached on this subject. Grace, what is grace? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Why did you get that, Pastor Chris? Well, that's an acrostic. God's riches at Christ's expense, okay? Okay, nobody gets it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to mention some kinds of grace from the scriptures today, if that's okay with you. Remember another word? used for grace is favor. And how many of you could use some of God's favor on your life right now, right? There's common grace. Common grace is God is no respecter of persons. Saving grace, you needed God's favor to deliver you from your sin, amen? amen. Healing grace, some of you have been sick and asked God to, for, the, for favor to heal you. Sanctifying grace, yes, in Assembly of God, we believe in the process of sanctification. Some churches don't, but we do. Sanctifying grace, we believe in that process. Provisional grace, how many want your needs met? That's provisional grace. M miraculous grace, we just talked about that in the altar. That's where God's manifest presence shows up. The working of miracles, signs and wonders, miraculous grace. Serving grace, we all have talents that help us serve in different areas. Can we agree with that? Sustaining grace. Sustaining grace is where you're like, Lord, help me to get through this situation. How many of you needed that one, right? But nobody ever speaks about giving grace. Ever. Except me. Did he just open the windows of heaven over this church? But it's been a while. It's been a while. So today I'm going to have to ask you for permission to continue on to speak on this subject. Because the last time I spoke on this subject, which was a couple of years ago, so for those who are thinking, oh, the preachers always talk on giving, that's a lie. It's been over two years. Matter of fact, it's been way more than that because it was a Sunday night service, and I preached on living in the kingdom of God and what it takes to live in the kingdom of God. And a lady came up to me afterwards and said, I raised both my daughters by myself and got them through high school, and I was never able to give 
So does that mean I can't enter the kingdom of God? Everything I preached, she took that one little part and made that's what I was saying. And we all know that's not what I was saying. But I'm going to tell you, you get what you give. And for those that say, you know, I, can't affo- I really can't afford to tithe or I can't afford to give, then you'll never be able to give. That's just, that's, that's the principles of giving. I'm just going to say that. So I quit preaching on it. Shut it down. Stopped it. I didn't want to hurt anybody else's feelings. So today, I'll give you a reason why. I think it's okay to bring this up. Is it okay to bring it up? Yeah. It is a touchy situation, touchy subject. If you want me to, you got to say, go for it. Okay, Acts 20, 33 through 35 in the New Living Translation. It was way too harsh for you in the New King James Version, so I probably notched it down a little bit for you today. It says, I have never coveted, this is Paul speaking, I have never coveted anyone's silver, gold, or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. It's not all about money. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Say it's more blessed. blessed. So I'm going to talk to you about this for a minute. Because this word in the Greek is mole. Like holy mole. Okay? Like guaca mole. Okay? Speaking that it's almost lunchtime. No. It means far more, exceedingly more. It literally means to be immeasurably more. So the Apostle Paul said this about his life. I remember something in my service to God that there is a dimension, everybody said dimension, of grace. That comes when a man or woman understands the power of generosity and he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. He said it's far more, it's exceedingly more, it's immeasurably more blessed to give than receive. Church, there is a lifestyle. Say there is a lifestyle. Now, just going to let you know, we already took the offering. I'm not going to take another offering. I'm not taking you down a road. So for you naysayers in here, don't worry. We're not passing the basket again. I'm not trying to manipulate you in any way. Simply trying to teach you a truth of God's word. Is that okay? There is a lifestyle that is exceedingly more and immeasurably more than what the average Christian in the average church in America is living under right now. There is a place in God where you can have a generous spirit follow the word of God and give and the windows of heaven will open over your life and bless you exceedingly more, immeasurably more. Can we agree that there's some people in this room that are just a little more blessed than others? True. Common grace. God is no respecter of persons. I'd like to front those people off, but it's really not cool to do that. I didn't have their permission, so I'm going to front somebody else off. So if you were to ask Hershey, the man who invented the Hershey kiss, anybody know who that is? Why he is more blessed than everybody around him, he would tell you it's because he learned the principle of tithe and offering. He writes it publicly. If you were to ask the man Kraft, who who brought the Kraft cheese people, the man who started the company, how did he get extremely more blessed than everybody else around him selling cheese. He would say it was through the giving, tithes, and offerings. So church, let's remember the word of Paul. Acts 20, 35 says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So some ask me, Chris, how is it that you're so blessed? Well, you know, when I got ready to do the sermon on envy, I'm like, really, Lord, you want me to preach on envy? 
And so usually when God, when I know it's the Holy Spirit telling me to preach on something, is he'll give me an idea, I'll start to put it together, and then he'll send me confirmation. And so I, I had somebody who comes, to, who, who, well, not that it matters. They used to come to our church. They go to another church now. Okay, not that that matters. But they came to me and his wife. They're struggling right now. You know, we just because we're Christians don't mean we don't end up in situations sometimes. You know, fruit is grown in the valley, not on the mountaintops. Okay, so sometimes we have to get a faith adjustment and go through the valley sometimes in situations. So I'm not, not preaching faith doctrine here, okay? He reigns on the just and the unjust alike. But they said, she walked in, she goes, she goes, my husband was saying that I just don't understand why it's so hard for us, and Chris is just so blessed. Why is Chris so blessed? And I thought, oh, there's envy. <laughs> because I'm getting ready to do a sermon on envy. Okay, Lord, preach this sermon. Somebody needs to hear it. But if you want to know why Chris is blessed, it's because I've learned, I've learned there is a way. Say, there's a way. That I can live above and beyond what normal Christians in America live. Not being arrogant. There is a way. Say, there's a way. And I've learned the power of giving grace. So what we want to do this morning is for the next few minutes, I'm going to be very abbreviated to explain how to access this grace, if you're interested. This is an unknown grace in the church where you can all walk in a more blessed dimension and we're going to do it in a way to make it easy to understand and to remember. We're going to talk about giving. You can almost hear the seats coming off the floor right now. I'm going to take you to a passage in the Word of God that is misunderstood, misinterpreted, and misused by preachers all the time and by Christians. Told you I'd mess up the way you read your Bible. In fact, we're going to look at a few misinterpreted, misused passages today. The first one we're going to go to is 2 Corinthians Chapter 8. Can we go deep? Can I go deep? Okay. Get your notebooks out. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 and 2. It says, Moreover, brethren, we made known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Say Macedonia. Macedonia. That in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, deep poverty, abounded in the riches of their liberality. You're like, whoa, that's deep. We'll explain it. So now Paul is writing to the Corinthian church here. And, and he's talking about their liberality. Other words, the Macedonian church, they didn't have anything to give, or basically didn't have much to give, but they abounded in riches, generous in their liberality. You staying with me? They were po church. Small church. Second Corinthians 3 and 4 says, For I bear witness, this is Paul saying, I've seen it, I was there, that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Freely willing. Imploring us, now that's a big word, with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. In other words, they were wanting Paul to take this offering and go to the Jerusalem and minister to the Jews. The Gentile church wanted him to go minister to the Jewish saints in Jerusalem. So who's Paul writing to? The Corinthian church. I'm about to teach you something here, so hang on. You ready? You'll probably never hear another preacher talk about this. This is revelation. <laughs> so we need to open your heart today. Because you give me permission to talk to you like Paul talked to the Corinthians. Do you understand that the Corinthians, their church had all the gifts manifested in it. 
People getting saved, people getting healed, blind seeing, speaking in tongues, words of knowledge. You know what I mean? Tongues and interpretation. They had it all going on. Matter of fact, they come into the church speaking in tongues, singing a song. They're blessed. They got God's favor over them. And he's talking to the Corinthians. So I want you to act like you're a Corinthian. Is that okay? Yeah. Both good and bad because we got it here. Remember, they're the ones that couldn't sw quit sleeping with it, somebody's wife and drinking, so <clears throat> they weren't holy. Can you imagine Paul writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, there's a dimension of grace that you know nothing about. He says, well, I want to make known to you this dimension of grace. is a dimension in God that you have never experienced before. They've, they've experienced it all. Travailing in the spirit, running down the aisles, Jericho march, healings, speaking in tongues. All, they, they, they've experienced it all. You're like, what are all those, Pastor Chris? We'll talk about it later. He said, but there's a church over in Macedonia, and they have come into an understanding or a revelation of this unknown dimension of grace that we would like to unlock for you today. And he said, how they unlock this dimension is by their giving. Everybody say giving. giving. Even though they didn't have anything. So for those of us that tried to use the excuse, I don't have anything to give, that excuse does not hold water scripturally. The Bible says that Paul said to the Corinthians, the Macedonians didn't have anything to give. But they took what little bit they did have even though they were struggling, and they put it together and they gave an offering. And what they were trying to do is they wanted to give the Apostle Paul an offering to take to preach the gospel back to the Jews in Jerusalem. Yes, a Gentile church taking an offering for Paul to take the gospel to the saints in Jerusalem. Now Macedonia is struggling. It's a small church. Macedonia is barely getting by. The members of the first Macedonian church was the Philippian jailer and the woman that the demon, got the demons cast out of her. That's my kind of church, by the way. <laughs> That's the kind of church I want to go to. It's a small church. These were the members of the early church. Corinth, on the other hand, is 10,000 members strong. They are the largest church in the New Testament. Yes, they're gifted in all the gifts, so let's not worry about the Holy Spirit scaring people out, okay? But they're the largest church in the New Testament. So today we want to help you unlock this unknown dimension of grace by, again, talking to you like the Corinthians. And Paul's talking about grace according to the Apostle Paul. He says, when we give, we enter into a dimension of grace that can't be entered into any other way. I'm going to say that again. When we give, we enter into a dimension of grace that can't be entered any other way. It seems clear from his writings that there's only one way to enter into this unique dimension of God's grace, and that is through something called giving. So, when we talk about giving, and y'all all, all tighten up, you straighten up, you can feel your seat get tight, and you're thinking, why is the preacher talking about money? That's all the churches ever talk about is money. That's not true, hardly ever. What we're doing, what you're doing, is unknowingly keeping yourselves out of a dimension of God's grace. Now, when you were broken and lost, you wanted grace for your salvation, right? Because you needed to be delivered from your sin, amen? amen? When you came in broken and sick, you wanted grace for your healing, right? Amen. Because you needed God to heal your body. Now, we all, we all want our needs met, right? So we're all believing in the grace of provision. God provide for me because you need your needs met, right? But if you're going to have all the graces, there is a dimension of grace that is far more, exceedingly more, and immeasurably more, better way of living 
And it comes by the grace of giving. There's four of them, Pastor. That's better than the first service. So can we go back through these scriptures again? Can I give you a repeat a little bit, right? Seems like you really didn't catch that, so I'm going to kind of diverse it a little bit, okay? So 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 and 2. We're going to go all the way down, 6 and 7. It says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That just tells you what I'm preaching is true. It says right there, I'm a, and we make known to you the grace of God that bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. It's a special grace. That in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, they po, abounded in the riches of their liberality. 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, 8, 3 and 4 says, For I bear witness, I witness this, Paul says, that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, say beyond their ability, they were freely willing. They gave more than they could afford to give. Kind of like the woman with two mites, amen? All right. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They wanted to be part of Paul going and preaching the gospel to the Jews in Jerusalem. But there's something I want to point out to you. Instead of the preacher asking to take an offering... The Macedonians are coming to Paul saying, you have to take our offering. Well, that's a turn of events, wouldn't you say? Instead of the preacher saying, hey, I implore you to give to this cause or whatever, he had the Macedonians come and saying, you've got to take what we want to give you. We want to be part of what you're doing. Now, what if that attitude perme permeated the body of Christ? Not only here with us, because this is a giving church, we have this full, and I believe it's the teachings over the time, but this is not you know, just us, but there are new people here. This church is growing, so you might need to hear this. But what if this went around the world? Not just in this little church on top, but what if all the churches, what if they had this attitude? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ would be a mighty force in the earth financially. Solomon said that the love of money is the root of all evil. But in his teaching, he also said money is the solution to everything. So watch now. Hold it. Paul says, you're struggling. You need this money more than we do. And they're saying, no, Paul, you have to let us give it. Paul's trying to reject the offering. That's what it meant. And he's like, no, no, you keep it. You need it. The Macedonians are saying, no, we don't want to keep it. We want to implore you. We want to give it to you. We can't afford not to give it to you. We can't afford not to give it to you. And Paul said, because of their attitude, listen to me, they unlocked an unknown dimension of grace that the Corinthians had never experienced in their lives. It unlocked a dimension of grace that the Corinthians have never experienced in their lives. You got to remember, they, they have it all going on in their church. They're a big church. They're booming. People are getting baptized. They're getting saved. It's growing every day. It's, you know, a big mega church. They got it all going on. People are speaking in tongues, falling out in the spirit. Miracles are happening. All of it's going on. They're running in the aisles. They're coming across the parking lot, singing a song. They got it all going on. He says, you've never experienced this. So let's point something out here. Who's Paul talking to? Right, he's, looking the book. he's in the book of Corinthians, right? I thought they already had the grace of God working in their life. Because if I go to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 through 7, it says, I thank my God always. This is Paul speaking. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which is given to you by Christ Jesus. That you were enriched in everything by in him, in him, in all utterance and knowledge. They speak it in tongues, got the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom manifesting. 
They got it all going on. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. They're saved because they're filled with the Holy Ghost so that you come short in no gift. He says, you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, what he said about the Corinthian church is by far, by every account, the Corinthian church was the most spiritual and the most dynamic church in the New Testament. That the windows of grace opened the, was over their lives. The windows of grace had opened over their lives. The Corinthian church had more grace going on in their services than any church in history in the New Testament. Yet Paul says there is a grace that you don't know about. Show is quiet here. And it's called the grace of giving. That when the Macedonians came to me, I didn't want to take their offering. They said, you must take my offering, our offering. When they did that, they unknowingly, say unknowingly, unknowingly, opened the dimension of grace over their life. Unknowingly opened the dimension of grace over their life. Can I talk about it for a minute? PowerPoint says, generosity unlocks a dimension of grace that will enable you to exceed your own ability. There are people in this church right now who bills are more than what they make, yet they get by and they still eat. They don't understand where it comes from. It just does when it needs to be. God shows up, provides for them. Am I lying? No. All right. Paul said, when they came to me and wanted to give an offering, I didn't want to take it. But they implored me to let them give it. They implored me to let them give it. And he said, let me tell you what happened. Even, when, even though they were poor and they didn't have any money to give, that they gave what they could, this is good. He said something happened. Grace hit their life. And what they could do, they did. But then all of a sudden, they started doing what they couldn't do in their own ability. I should say that again, huh? And what they could do, they did. But then all of a sudden, they started doing what they couldn't do in their ability. In other words, God blessed them. So I tell you again, there is a way. Say, there's a way. Charged to operate and live under an exceedingly more immeasurable way of life. Where the blessing of God is opened over you. Giving is the way to unlock this unknown grace. That the church world, by and large, doesn't know anything about. I'm not going to say it this time because I didn't get a yes or no on that, but some of you are thinking I'm full of something right now. But let me ask you, as you're clenched tight right now, isn't it interesting, now pay attention here, that the devil attacks right here. The devil always attacks church people and starts talking to them about why they shouldn't give. Oh, the Bible never, the New Testament doesn't speak about tithing. Oh, you know, the, I'm reading now the New Testament right now. Over and over, I can go day after day. I could do this for months. Trust me, I have. It might not say the word tithe, but the principle is still the same. Matter of fact, it's not a tenth. It's all now. Be glad you only got to give 10% and not all, right? Be pass about time to pass a hat right now, gentlemen. Let's, no, just kidding. <laughs> but this is where the devil always attacks. So can I just say it for a second? It's like in politics. If the entire establishment is against one person, you might want to pay attention. If all hell is against certain principles of the word of God, you need to pay attention. Because it could be that those principles that hell is against are the things that will rebuke the devourer off your life and cause a new dimension of God's grace to come upon you. Could it be? This is Paul again writing in the same passage, verses 6 and 7. 
2 Corinthians 8, 6 and 7. Paul says, so we urge Titus that as he begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So don't tell me tithing is not in the New Testament. He told the Pharisees, you are so quick to give 10% of all these things, yet you'll let this go. I wish you would do this too, talking about tithing. I wish you would do this too. Paul said, you know about grace. You know about grace. The church. Is this where we come up? Do you feel stuck financially? Are you struggling with your job? Are you having a hard time paying the bills? Do you feel like you're struggling to get ahead? It is the time upon which we live in. Can I tell you this morning? The Apostle Paul said about the Macedonian giving unlocks a dimension of grace that will cause you not only to do what you can do, but to exceed your ability. In other words, giving unlocks a dimension of grace that will turn your money supernatural. God will turn your money supernatural. So I'm going to share this with you as I did the first service, because this is how my world goes. Me and John, we drive to Hayward to pick up that pew that's in the back. Now, first of all, I want you to know about the pew and walking in the dimension of God's grace is my wife needed a pew. She was willing to paint it black, but she wanted an early 1900s pew. So she's on the Internet looking for the certain pew. Had to have the curve, okay? Had to be 10 feet because that's the distance we need. But she's willing to paint it, faithless. Anyway, so she sends it down there. Not, no, I'm just kidding, babe. She sends me down to Hayward to pick up this pew. She says, I got one. You got to go get it. I got to drive all the way to Hayward. So the only person I can get to ride with me to Hayward is John because it's not really safe driving with me. People try to kill me all the time. Anyway, so we drive to Hayward. We pick up the pew. The first thing we want you to notice is that it is the exact same color of wood that the floors are. I also want you to know that the color of the pad is the exact same color as our church. Now, how did they know in 1910 in Ireland when they made that pew that we were going to need it today in this church in 2024? And how did that all of a sudden pop up over there, 1910? That's when it was great. If you want to know, it's a 1910 pew in perfect condition with the same color seating as we have right here. So I get there to pay for this pew. And it's $350. There's nothing wrong telling you what we paid for it. And so I, I don't carry a wallet because it makes my pants fall down. No matter how tight I pull the belt, it comes down. There's, there's nothing to hold it, okay? Anybody else struggle with that? There you go. So I don't. So I carry my money like this, okay? I probably should have thinned that down before this sermon. But anyway, so I carry my money like this. And so we get there, we load it up, we drive right to the house. Google takes us there. What's the chances of that? The guy shows up. Now, the only difference is, I'm going to tell you how, the, how God works. The guy we got it from bought these pews from a church so he could remodel a church on, on Angel Island so he could do gay marriages. And the, just the pew was too wide to fit in his church. So he had these pews, and he just so happened to have one that was 10 feet wide. And so um, he brings it. We get to minister to him. You know, it doesn't matter. I'll minister. And so, uh, we, yeah, we rescued it. And so uh, we put it in the truck. And it's $350. So I open my briefcase, and I pull the hundreds out. One, two, three, four. And I realized instead of asking him for change, I remember I had a $50 bill here like this. 
So I lay the 100 down, I take the 50 and throw it on the 300 and realize I go one, two, three, four. I had five $1 bills. Trust me, I cannot survive on five $1 bills. <laughs> so I take the 100 off my chest. Now I counted it, five $1 bills. If I had a 20, I'd have been cool, but there were no 20s or nothing there. I had five $1 bills. I take the 100, put it on my money, stick it in my pocket, pay him 350 bucks. We pull out of Hayward. We drive down the street. We both got a pee because, you know, we're up in age. And so we realize, <laughs> actually, I used the guy's bathroom, but John was too afraid to. But it was, it was a very nice, clean house, by the way. <laughs> very meticulous. But anyway, so we, we decided to pull into Casper's Hot Dog. And too bad for John that they don't have any public bathrooms in Hayward. So <laughs> I'm cool. I use the dude's bathroom with the pew. But anyway, so John... We go, in the, we go in there, it's like 11.30 in the morning, and so we go, we got to get a Casper's hot dog. Have you ever seen a Casper's hot dog stand since the 1980s? You know, it's been a long time since I've seen one, right? So we got to stop and get one. Now, we might be hungry by the time we get the net, but we'll just stop and eat again. But we're going to get a Casper's hot dog, and John, you're going to use the bathroom, but not, okay? So I get in there, I get into the bathroom, I got in, not the bathroom, but into the Casper's hot dogs, and we, we ordered two hot dogs. And so I op take my money out. A hundred. One, two, three, four, five ones. I look at her and go, can you break a hundred? She goes, it's kind of early. We just opened. I don't know if I can. I said, that's okay. I'll just go out to my truck and get my credit card out of my wallet. Put my money in my pocket. I go to leave. John goes, I got a $20 bill. I said, great, I'll give it back to you later when I break the 100. So he got the 20, and it's $23 for two hot dogs. $23 for two hot dogs. So I go, don't worry, John, I got three ones. So I pull it out, 100, a 20, a 10, a 5, and five ones. A 100, a 20, a 10, a 5, and five ones. Now, I counted it right in front of everybody in the place, and we're all looking. I'm like, never mind, John. Put your 20 away. 20, one, two, three. And the lady looks at me. She goes, can you touch my purse? <laughs> when you give, God can turn your money supernatural. About a dozen of you believe that today, praise the Lord. <laughs> Paul said to the Corinthian church, you got grace for everything, but there's still one area that you need to abound in. This grace. Paul takes their offering. When he takes their offering in the book of Philippi and Acts, they records it. In Acts 20, 33 to 35, this is where we get the scripture that we read in the beginning. And it's making the statement that it is more blessed to give than to receive. He's talking about what the Macedonians did. Even possibly what he learned, a revelation that was given to him by what the Macedonians did. At this point, Paul himself realized there is a grace, a dimension of grace that we can live in that the church in general does not know about. Because when we go to the book of Philippians, Philippians 4.19, now here's one of them misquoted scriptures. Are you ready for this? You gave me permission to mess up the way you read your Bible. Philippians 4.19 said, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How many quote that? Yes, many of us quote that, but it is a promise based on what the obedience of the Macedonian church. It is a promise based on the obedience of the Macedonian church. That ought to set in real quick. Somebody say the grace of giving. Grace it unlocks an unknown dimension of grace. Now some of you in this room, you're going to be stiff-necked and not believe anything I'm teaching. It's okay, I don't care. I'm not here to take another offering. Things are good here. I just thought I would share this. 
if you were close to me in, in the, growing up in the church, the very first thing I would teach you is these principles. There are many in this church that I have, and they know that it's true. There's some of you here today that are going to believe this revelation, and God's going to open the windows of heaven over your life in 2024. Just so happens that God told me the other day, I was like, I, I preached a message on Sunday. I did a marriage covenant teaching on the day of Sunday. It's Monday morning. I got to preach 48 hours later on a Wednesday night. I don't have nothing. I don't have an idea. I'm like, Lord, what should I preach on? And he gives me the scripture. There, behold, a door has been set, a great and effectual door has been opened before me. But there are many adversaries. Mm -hmm. That word great in Hebrew is mega. A big door has been opened before me. Because Paul knew that there was a door open for him to go to Ephesus and to bring people to Christ. But he's stuck in Corinth in this 10,000-member church because they're still not grown up. He can't leave because they're still eating baby food and drinking bottles. He says, there's been a great and effectual door open before me, but there are many adversaries. And so that has so far grown into three messages for Wednesday night. So if you want to hear those, you got to come on Wednesday night. I ain't sharing it on Sunday morning. Because I believe there's something about the Wednesday night service that God wants to use a certain group of people for a certain purpose. Because I'm about to tell you, we are going to see the largest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. There's not only a door open over Lake County, there's a door open over the entire world at this time which we live in. Before God comes for his church, he's going to work through his church. Amen? So basically, the first service on Wednesday was this time for the church to grow up. So sometimes you've got to preach on touchy situations. Amen? Amen? But I believe 2024 is going to be the year of more. We can see traces of it right now, can't we? We can see the windows of heaven open. We can see the door, the amount of people that get saved. Last Sunday, there was like five people got saved. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Right? The windows of heaven are opened up. People are coming. I got six weddings, five or six weddings to do of people who, who have not been married, but now they want to get married. Why is that? Is God saying it's time to get yourself right because we're coming into a time? We're coming into a time? Let me go on. Whew. I'm almost done. You're like, Pastor, have you looked at what's going on? The economy is crashing. You're right, it is. Inflation is up. They tell you it's up this much, but really it's up this much. It's almost $250 a week for a single person to eat anymore. It's crazy. And nobody's wages went up that far. Things are getting more expensive. We, we, the economy is crashing. How do you expect us to give? I don't expect you. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. I could care less whether you give or not. God takes care of me. Now, do you understand that the only place God says to test him is in your finances? He says, test me and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you can't contain. That's Scripture, Malachi 3. Not passing a basket. Don't trip. But I am telling you, we are going into some tough times. We are going in some time, but did you know? Do you understand that we are not of this world? We as children of God, the church, we are of a different kingdom. Say amen. amen. We are of a different kingdom. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. When the world comes crashing down, we can still be blessed. Nothing new under the sun. Egypt can be fallen apart under a curse, and the children of God can be blessed in the land of Goshen. Go look it up. The grace this one church unlocked enabled Paul, you want to come on up, Pastor? Enabled Paul to preach the gospel all over the known world at that time. This grace they took an offering so that he could send him to preach the gospel to the Jews in Jerusalem. And because of what they did, because they gave what they did gave, give, 
they were able to give more above their ability. Do you understand what I just said there? At one point, they came to a decision. We need to implore Paul to take this message to the Jews. So we gathered every little thing we had. We put it together. We go to give it to Paul. Paul says, I don't want your offering. You need it more than me. Like, no, Paul, we need you to give, take this offering. We want you to take the gospel to those who need to hear the gospel. We don't want anybody to die and go to hell. We can make more money, but we can't save them once they go to hell. So we're going to take this little bit that we have, and we're going to implore you to go and save this group of people from going to hell. We're going to take this money, save this group of people from going to hell. And because of that, the Bible says that it opened an unknowing grace of giving over their church, and they were able to do what they could do, but then they could do more than they were able to do. Because history, church history, tells us that Paul, after that, he went to Troas, Philippi, even went to Rome. And do you know who paid for that? The Macedonian church. The little church that didn't have 10,000 members had about 20 who took everything they have, now can take the point that they're able to sponsor Paul as he goes to the unknown world and reaches out and saves people from going to hell. They took what little they had. I'm talking to somebody right now. They took a little of what they had, and they put it together and said, go do this. And because they were willing freely to give, God said, I'm going to open the windows of heaven over your life to give you more because you're willing freely to give more. So when you do that, I'm going to give you more. The Bible says we can't outgive him. Do you see how that multiplies over and over? When you will be just a funnel from this to this, he will pour it through you and you get to take dividends off the end as it goes through. Before he comes back for his church, he's going to work through his church. There is a lifestyle that we can live above your average Christian in America right now. And it comes through the grace of giving. So if you're here today, far more important than any of that is you've got to be in a place that you can receive this gift. You have to be born again. You have to be born again. So if you're in this place today and you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to plead with you today, make that decision. The Bible says that when you're born again, you're not of this world, you're lifted to another dimension. You now live in the kingdom of God. You're not subject to what goes on down here. You're not subject to the drama that goes on. You're not subject to the disease and everything that goes on down here. You now live above. You are a king and a priest in the kingdom of God. And you will know when that happens because your, the attitude, the, the, the atmosphere upon which you stand, it will change. So if that's you today, as the altar team comes up, I'm going to ask that you would take that opportunity to come and ask the, one of the altar members, ministers, to minister to you in a prayer that will change your life forever. And then what I want you to do is I want you to grab a Bible off this thing right here. Because when you leave this place, the devil is already waiting at your car door to steal the word that has been planted in your heart today. I want you to take that little book and slap him in the face with it. I want you to stop on your way out. There's a sign-up sheet for a baptism on July 10th. We do them every three months around here because it seems to be that's where God has us doing them every three months. Put your name on the baptism because that's the next step. That's the next dimension upon which you want to be in as you enter in the kingdom of God. God is a God of process and order. If you're here today, and you're like, Pastor Chris, I heard everything you said. But it just, I, just, I just don't know how, where, what, when, and why. There's many of us. You don't understand. I'm on a fixed income. I got this. And God understands. The woman with two mites gave all she had, and God blessed her. He said, Bet greater is she in the kingdom. I'm not asking to put yourself in the debt or anything. 
But the Bible says that they gave with what little they had, and what they were able to do, they were able to do more past their ability. That's scripture. That's not Pastor Chris speaking to you. That's not manipulating the word of God. That's the truth. The only place God says to test them is in your finances. So if you're struggling, if you're barely getting by, if you're, uh, I serve El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. If you're serving El Get By, that's on you. That's on you. There is a dimension upon which we can live in that is above the average of the American church today. I'm being honest with you. I lived it. I can point people out here who live it right alongside me. I just wanted to share it with you today. A place where God can multiply your money in your pocket and make it supernatural. If you're here today and you're sick and you're broken physically, mentally, financially, I would ask that you'd humble yourself and come up and allow one of the altar workers to pray with you. The Bible says where two or more are gathered, he is there in the presence. And in his presence is where the miracles happen. That's why this is such an important area right here. It's his presence that matters. It's his time. If you've got something the doctors can't fix, well, maybe it's not physical, it's spiritual. If they don't have the answer or solution, God wants to show himself real to you today. Whether it's physically, mentally, or financially. He wants to show himself real. Give him that opportunity. Come up and allow one of these altar ministers to minister to you so that you can give me a testimony. You can't have a testimony without a test first. Amen? Amen. And for the rest of you here today, if you, if you just need to spend some time with God because you just need to, this section's open for you right here. Come sit at his feet. He just wants to spend time with you. If you want to spend time with him right here, next five minutes is all I'm going to ask. Just spend your time in worship and worship him. Thanks for